equation from? What's the term, why is the terminology normal equations? Because there's a geometric linear algebraic point of view of this linear regression. It's very important in terms of motivating uh, things like degrees of freedom. So what I'm going to do here is rewrite the normal equations in the following way. Normal equations can be written one, uh, beta zero hat times the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have um, like this. I guess I better rewrite the normal equations down. They were beta zero hat uh, summation 1 plus um, beta 1 hat summation xi minus, I'll just put it this way, minus summation yi equal to 0 and beta 0 hat summation xi plus beta 1 hat summation xi squared minus summation xi yi equal to 0. Now I'm going to write the following. I'm going to put this, this bold 1, which is how I'm going to write it here, just two 1's together, <laughs> all right, as uh, a vector in Rn of all 1's. This is in Rn. You've got old Euclidean space of n dimensions. So that's a vector, n-dimensional vector. So that's uh, n by 1, right? This is an n-dimensional vector column vector, and I'm going to write x with an arrow over it, simply is just the column vector of all the x values, x1, x2, down to xn, and similarly I can write y with an arrow over the top, and not to, not to be confused with the bar, the arrow versus the bar, right? y as y1, y2, down to yn, That's, those are vectors, those are all vectors in Rn. And then I have the usual dot product or inner product. Sorry, Travis, I got started a little bit. I want to do the geometry of the normal equations. And so I'm introducing the normal equations. This was 1 and 2 for the normal equations. And um, I'm rewriting them in terms of the inner product, the Euclidean inner product. This is the Euclidean inner product. What is the Euclidean inner product? When I take the inner product of two vectors, u and v, uh, I'm talking about that summation ui vi. Okay, so it's kind of a discrete integration, right? It's a summation. All right, before I was doing integrals, <laughs> now I'm doing. So that's I'm bringing in the summation thing. All right, so the first normal equation, if I put the summation yi to the left hand side, could be written this way. All right, so I'm saying this vector is orthogonal to the one. And then, I, so it's going to be uh, some orthogonality conditions. And the second equation can be written as, um, why did I do that? Um, yeah, it can be written as this. Beta 0, 1, plus beta 1 times x minus y is orthogonal to the x vector. That's the second equation. So there, so this, so I can think of y, okay, think of back to that uh, diagram I had where I had um, x, through, we've called the previous example where I had x, y, and I could call this y hat also, whereas x is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, y was, let's see, it was 2, 0, 1, 3, 4, I think, okay? And then I had my y hat, which was from the equation, which was the negative 0.1, right, uh, negative, excuse me, a plus 0.6, a plus uh, 1.3, and then I had a 2.0, a 2.7, and a 3.4. So in this case, in this little example, this is the x vector, this is the y vector, and this is the vector of predictance, 
predictions. And that's all this is. This is just your why hat. That's what that vector is right there. Okay, because it's, how do I calculate the y hat? I, I put, right, the coefficients in and I calculate it, right? It was the beta hat, you know what I'm saying? It was beta zero hat times one plus, so I made all this notation, but it'll kind of make sense in the end, I think. There's a lot of notation on the first days. Beta one hat times x. Okay. So that is a, as written as a vector. That's how I actually calculate this vector. I take all the constants. They were all in there. The one, two, three, excuse me, the uh, negative point one was in there, right? In each term, it was negative point one. Each time, it was negative point one, negative point one, negative point one, negative point one. Eh. Write it this way. So this this writes it out as negative point one, negative point one, negative point one, negative point one, negative point one plus um, um, beta point seven times one, two, three, four, five. Okay? I put I, I multiply the negative point one through the one if you want, but that's how I've I've done it. Okay? Make sense? So this is the beta zero times one. And this is the beta 1 times x. And when I add it up, I get my y hat vector. Okay, this is saying that y hat is a vector minus y is perpendicular to 1. This is the y hat minus y is perpendicular to x. Okay, so this is 2. So that means y hat minus y it's perpendicular to both 1 and x, therefore it's perpendicular to the linear span of 1 and x in Rn. So that's the picture I'm going to draw. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and draw Rn, if you can imagine it, because it's always going to be in our imagination in R3 only, as <laughs> the best we can do, usually. So a linear span of two vectors. First, I'm going to put the origin here. I'm going to put the vector 1 along this line. So this, this is just going to be the linear span of the vector 1. Just in, other, in other words, all constant multiples of the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So that has 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 on it. It has 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2 on it. It has 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. It has negative point 1, negative point 1, negative point 1, negative point 1, negative point 1 on it, and so on. That's, the, that's a line to the origin, OK? <clears throat> then I also have the x vector somewhere, and I'm just going to sort of put it out here uh, just to get it out of the way. Put this little, a short little vector out here just to sort of get it out of the way um, to show that it's there. And, it's, and then I have the span of the plane. I get two vectors to make a plane, right? And so this is the linear span of x1, of x, and 1. Okay, I'm not putting an arrow over the 1 because it's sort of, you have to, you know, I don't need an extra arrow. I could put it, but the bold one is, is a good enough factor, isn't it? <laughs> okay. All right. So that's the plane, all right? These two vectors span this plane. Then y is just some hairy vector out in Rn. It's not going to lie in this plane already. If it does, then I claim that already the data is on a straight line. If y was in that plane, okay, then um, the y would be of the form beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. Beta 0 times 1 plus beta 1 times x. Because this is the whole plane. All vectors that lie in that plane are of this form. That, that is the linear span right there, is beta 0 and beta 1 vary. All right? Linear span is the set of all. Beta 0, 1 plus beta 1 times x. There I made it explicit as beta 0 and beta 1 vary. Okay? That is the linear span. So you can see how this is setting up. So if y lies in the plane, then it in fact is already a straight line fit. You're, the data is exactly on a straight line already. Is everybody following that? 
Um, if, in other words, if if this if the increments were if if uh, if the difference between uh, successive values of the y's here was a constant, which is what it is here, right? It's 0.7 constant. Okay, that would be the slope. Okay, and that would correspond to just uh, the y vector belonging to this plane in Rn. Okay. All right, so here's why. Presumably, it doesn't already. The data doesn't already lie in a straight line. Okay. All right. Then uh, this tells me that what. It, but now y hat, of course, is going to be a vector in the plane. All right. So here's y hat, which corresponds. I mean, once I know y hat, I know the beta zero and the beta one hat. You know, I just, I just. These are the. Uh, Coordinate beta zero and beta one are the coordinates for the basis x and one, right? So once I know the vector, I can calculate the coordinates easily enough by solving the linear equation or whatever. Uh, easy, easy to find. Okay, so there is my y hat, and so that can, that has the information about the slope param slope parameter and the intercept parameter. Okay, and so what this tells me is that um, what does it tells me? It tells me that y minus y hat is perpendicular to both generators of the plane. It's perpendicular to x and it's perpendicular to 1. Okay, so that means that uh, y hat is the orthogonal projection of y onto this plane. All right, there's a right angle here to everything in the plane. Um, so it's actually right angles to anything in the plane, so I'm going to make a bunch of right angle signs showing that it's perpendicular to everything in the plane. This, this, this sticker here that goes from the head of y hat to the head of y is perpendicular to everything in the plane. It's a normal line to the plane. Okay? And so really, this is just... Um, so why, this is why they call the normal equations. <laughs> okay? This is two normality or orthogonality conditions. All right? Just saying that y hat is the orthogonal projection. y hat equals orthogonal projection of y onto the linear span of x and 1. And usually, when I write it in the, book, in the notes, I didn't use the word orthogonal. I just said it's the projection, because that is code word for usually, well, when we talk about projection, we mean orthogonal projection. OK? <clears throat> so now I've done some other things in the book, I mean in the notes. What if I projected only on to the linear span of one? What would that be? What's your intuition? What would the actual be? If what I only had, um, if I only had equation one, what would be the solution? Uh, wait a second. That doesn't make sense. Uh, actually, suppose I didn't have, so that wouldn't have the x. So equation one doesn't make sense uh, without the x. So suppose I had this equation without the x. Suppose well, I only had equation 1, but I took the x out. <laughs> All right? What would that be? That would be that beta 0 hat, that would be the orthogonal projection onto the linear span of 1. What would that be? All the y's have to be the same. All the y's have to be the same. Okay. And so what do you think they'd all be? Any guess? How about y bar times 1? Okay? All the y's have to be the same. What's the best way you can do that? It would be with y bar. In other words, I have to minimize. The, remember in Euclidean geometry, the, the, the orthogonal projection corresponds to finding the point on the space that you're projecting onto that minimizes the distance. All right? If I want to do minimize summation yi minus c squared i goes from 1 to n over all c what is the answer c equals y bar okay that takes a little bit of uh, arithmetic to work out a little quadratic equation but that's the basic fact about the mean it minimizes uh, the sum of the variability okay is equal to summation yi minus y bar squared. So the fact is that Euclidean geometry corresponds to orthogonality here. Uh, it corresponds to minimizing this distance. That's the Euclidean geometry. <clears throat> okay. 
and which we'll all take for granted at this point maybe, okay, <laughs> this is such a short summer. But, uh, you know, probably it would be a good homework exercise to verify, you know, you know to take the partial derivative or whatever, you know, with respect to C itself. So it's exactly the same thing we had before, only more elementary because there's only one parameter, okay? Only one parameter, so this is the most basic model of all. If I wanted to fit the scatter plot with a horizontal line, that was the best fit. I put it at y bar. I put it to the uh, put it to the horizontal at the level y bar. Is that kind of intuitively obvious? I wouldn't take it like way up at infinity or way down at minus infinity. I'd take it right at y bar. All right. So that would be if I wanted to fit a constant linear function to the data, all right? So that would be uh, beta zero equals y bar. There is no beta one, because I'm assuming that beta one is zero, okay? So that would be another thing. So now this is what we call s y y, okay? This, the square this is, what I'm gonna do in this picture is I'm gonna label, I did it in the notes, maybe a little bit more visible there, because I had more care. But here, um, is what I'm going to have right here is a right triangle. This right triangle is what I'm going to focus on right here, this one that's out here. Not the one that goes to the origin. There's a right triangle there, too. It goes like this, here, and here. That corresponds to the no-intercept model. Okay? There's another right triangle. But this right triangle that's out here is the one I'm going to focus on. Okay? S, Y, Y, this is what I've called it, because if I actually look at the summation Y minus Y bar squared, that's what I, well, I didn't call that yet, but that's what I call S, Y, Y. We had S, X, X. This is with X in place of Y, okay? Or Y in place of X. Okay? This is S, Y, Y. Okay? Variability of the Y's. And that's the square length of this side. I have a Pythagorean relationship, right? If I have a right triangle in Euclidean space Rn, maybe you're familiar with R3 or R2, but in general, if I've got this orthogonality business, then I have a Pythagorean relationship. Okay? This is what we didn't measure yet, but this would be the sum of the errors. If I define EI to be equal to Y I minus Y hat sub I, okay? I, did I, I didn't mention that I was calling this Y hat before, but that's what I'm going to do. If I plug in, if I uh, then I did call it y hat, didn't I? When I made that this this column, the 0.6, the 1.3, the 2.0, 2.7, and 3.4. Okay, it's y hat sub i. Okay, <laughs> all right. The predicted values. All right, those are called predicted. If I take this is the predicted, if I just take the difference of those two columns, which comes out to be in this case, um, ah. Well, I have to copy it down again. So let's just go ahead and do that. I'll just copy it down again. It's not very hard. So if I take yi and y hat sub i, which is the the 2, 0, the 1, 3, and 4. And this came out to be 0 0.6, 1.3, 2.0, 2.7, 2 and 3.4. Okay. And then I take the difference. And I call that ei. All right. Those are the actual errors. Now, as opposed to the epsilon i, ei is not the same as the epsilon i. Epsilon i is a theoretical thing. That's the actual error, which we'll never know. Ei is the estimated error, okay? Because it's y i not, it's y i minus beta zero hat plus beta one hat xi, okay? which is not the same thing as y i minus beta zero plus beta one x i. I'm not subtracting the actual true but unknown parameter formula, right? I don't know, maybe I should slow up a little bit. These therefore come out to be um, 1.4, negative 1.3, um, negative one, plus 0.3, and plus 0.6. All right, and guess what do they add up to? Zero. zero. Why does that have to be true? Because the first normal equation says that the errors add up to zero. First normal equation. It says y hat. This is it says the same thing as e one equals zero because this this is my e and this says that e x 
So I'm simplifying the normal equations over and over. <laughs> okay, now I've got it down to two lines. E1 equal to zero and Ex equal to zero. Okay? That says that the difference between y and the thing that's in the plane, all right, should be orthogonal to the plane. That means that this sticker is just, you know, sticking up here. This is my E, okay? And the square length of E, I'm going to call that equal to um, SS res, the residual sum of squares, okay? Two S's and a sub res. <laughs> You're going to be notationally challenged after today. It's just going to burn you out, but uh, <laughs> that's the way it is. That's the residual sum of squares. But that's just a square length of this, um, this side of the triangle, okay? S, Y, Y is the square length of that side of the triangle. It's, uh, believe it or not, in order to uniformize notation, I've got two notations for it, S, Y, Y, and also S, S, T for total sum of squares. <laughs> Total sum of squares. Believe it or not, he's got all these notations in the first chapter. Okay. Total sum of squares. It's kind of nasty. And then what do you think he's going to call this, the square length of this side of the triangle? Regression sum of squares, so SSR. That's why SSR, as opposed to SS res for residual. This is the regression sum of square length. equals regression sum of squares. So I can actually write down formulas. The main, this is the, I would like you to have this picture memorized, but at least it's in the notes, okay? So what I have is that I have a table, and let's go ahead and write down what that was. The S, Y, Y was the sum of squares here. I take the, I take the variability of this column, okay? The variability of this column is um, what? It turns out y hat bar equals y hat. That also follows from the first equation. Okay? So the y hat, this, the average of this y hat, I said the y, the, y, the y bar was 2, right? What's the average of this column? It's also 2. All right, that's kind of obvious the way we, from what we've done so far. This also follows from this first equation. It says y hat minus y into 1 is 0, so that means y hat bar equals y bar, okay? The same as saying that e bar equals a 0, all right? So, so I have this side, this side of the equation is y hat minus y bar squared. That's what SSR is, okay? SST is summation y i minus y bar, which is the sum of the square, the variability of the first column, the variability of the second column, and then the variability of the third column, well, the center of that ver of those is zero. And that's just what this third one is. So I have the, this, the sum of, the, the variability of the first column is the sum of the variabilities of the second two columns. That's the orthogonality going on. Okay? Uh, e bar equals a zero y hat bar equals y bar. And then you have y bar down here. So if I take the variability of this first column, it's, it's broken down into a sum of these two other variabilities exactly. That's the Pythagorean relationship. Let's check it. Um, by hand, I guess. Right? S, y, y, we already calculated is S, y, y equals summation y, i minus y bar squared. That came out to be 10. Um, the SSR, or this is SST equals this, okay, SSR is summation y hat i minus y bar squared, which comes out to be what? Let's do it by hand. y bar is 2, so this is a negative 1 point, huh? What did I do? Yeah, no, so, so I have to actually calculate that. It's 0 0.6 minus 2. 1.3 minus 2, 2.0 minus 2, 2.7 minus 2, and 3.4 minus 2. So what does that come out to be? Is everybody following this? I didn't put this in the notes. 
but it's a negative 1.4 simply because it's that number, but only by action because y i cannot be the mean in this case. One, negative 1.4 squared plus uh, a negative 0.7 squared plus a 0 squared plus a 0.7 squared plus uh, 3.4 minus 2 is 1.4 squared. Okay. So this uh, that looks right. And so what does it come out? 0.7 squared is 0.49. 1.4 squared is twice that, which is 1.96. So 1.96 plus 0.49 plus 0 plus 0.49 plus 1.96 comes out to be 49 and 96 is uh, 145, right? 145, 245 times 2 is 4.9. Okay? And some of the EI squares, I already calculated that out. There's actually a nice way to do it. Summation EI squared, there's a nice formula for it. <laughs> Turns out, because that summation YI minus Y hat I, okay, where this comes out to be uh, squared, where this comes out to be YI minus, and this is a convenient formula when you're going to need this formula, minus I'm going to call it y bar plus uh, beta 1. I'm going to write the least squares line like this. Beta 1 hat x i minus x bar. Remember the y, x bar, y bar was a point on the least squares line? So beta 1, so this is kind of the uh, corresponding form of the straight line where I'm looking at it, the, the point slope formula, right? I'm looking at it, the line passing through x bar, y bar. So I'm using the normal equations there. The, this is the least squares line. Uh, where I now put the, instead of putting beta 0 plus beta, so the beta 0 is stuck in here because y bar minus beta 1x bar is beta 0. Remember? From equation 1. So this, this minus beta 1x bar is beta 0. All right. Anyway, so that's this thing squared. Okay. Um, And, um, well, then you go ahead and you uh, multiply this whole thing out. Okay, it looks nasty, but um, it comes out nicely. Uh, it is nasty, but it comes out nicely. Okay. <laughs> um, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. No, this doesn't come out so nicely. This actually, yeah, I see what's happening. Okay. This actually does come out to be, what I'm going to do is if I multiply it all out, I'm just going to recover the, Pythag the Pythagorean relationship. What am I going to get? This is the one that comes out nicely. I'm sorry, this is the one that comes out nicely. Let me write this one out using this, because then it's this minus y bar. Then it comes out nicely. So this turns out to be summation. Uh, okay, so what's the nice way to do that one? This 4.9 is the one that comes out nicely. How do I get it? This is, this is just going to repeat the Pythagorean relationship. I'll, I'll show you in a second. What does the 4.9 come out to be? This comes out to be summation y bar plus beta 1 hat xi minus x bar minus the y bar squared. Okay? I go from 1 to n. Then the y bars cancel because this is now a y bar and not a y. All right, so these y bars cancel and then I just have beta 1 hat squared times SXX, the sum of the XI minus X bar squared. So that's the one that comes out nicely. I already had SXX recorded. It was 10. The beta 1 hat was 0.7. I had already calculated it. So this is 0.7 squared times 10, which is the 0.49 times 10, which is 4.9. That's why that came out so nicely, the 4.9. All right? So there's a formula for SSR. 
in the simple linear regression context. Okay? The regression sum of squares. And then how do I get this thing, which is nastier looking? Well, by the Pythagorean relationship. This turns out to be SYY minus SSR. Okay? Because SSR plus SS res is SY. Why? Okay? So actually you can see this coming out. If you look at this, if I take the terms Y minus Y bar and separate that out, and then I have a minus sign, then you multiply the whole thing out and you get some SXYs coming in and then you have the formula beta 1 hat is SXY over SXX. When you work it all out, it, it, it actually does work out to this using this is your SSR. So the algebra can be used to, in fact, verify this Pythagorean relationship. I'm using the Pythagorean relationship to avoid going through that algebra there, okay? But it can actually be verified. You can sort of see it, hopefully, in your mind's eye. You following? That if I actually go through the algebra, then I will be able to come up with this identity. which is equivalent to the Pythagorean relationship. In this context, for the picture shown. And that particular triangle, okay? Okay, um, that's called the residual sum of squares and so on. So you get a little, to summarize all the calculations, you get a little, a little box here, okay? <laughs> and the first line is, and then what you have is you have, on the side of the box you have labels, you have um, regression, you have error or residual, and you have total, and then on the top you have sum of squares. And the way this little table is organized is, okay, this is SSR, which just came out to be 4.9. You have the total sum of squares, which is SST, which was 10. SS, SYY was the same as SXX, which was 10. Because they had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, they had 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 for the values of the X's and the Y's, you know, after you unjumble them, you know, individually. I had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 0 through 4. That has the same variability. Right? They're, they're both uh, uniform, <laughs> okay, between 1 and 5, or, or 0 and 4, so they have the same variability. The variability of this column was 10. The variability of this column was 10. X bar was 3, Y bar was 2. But the variabilities are the same. They're 10, all right? That's the variability of the Ys, is 10. S Y S Y Y. There's only one S. I don't know why they S S for sum of squares. S for squares. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And then the error you always calculate in practice just by subtraction. S S res is 5.1. So the 4.9 plus 5.1 equals to 10. So. You do that. And then you have degrees of freedom associated with that. Okay, now we're going to get into that in a little bit, maybe next time some more. It turns out that degrees of freedom um, well, let's have a look over here. How many, if I think about this in terms of I, I have one random variable, beta 1 hat, okay, and I square it, and I multiply it by some constant, okay? There's only one degree of freedom in, in the regression sum of squares, okay? Because it only corresponds to the slope, all right? I take out the intercept, so to speak, and put it into this SST, so this has n minus 1 degrees of freedom, which is equal to 4 in this case, and the regression sum of squares that has two degrees of freedom. Excuse me, uh, 
n minus 2, n minus 2 degrees of freedom, which is 3. Okay, in this case. For simple linear regression, this is 1. And I'm going to try to, by going through a statistical review, which I was going to try to do uh, today, uh, I can try to motivate some of these degrees of freedom things here. And then it goes on. Then what I do is I take these, it, I'm just going to show you what is done for this. This is called the analysis of variance table, or for short, ANOVA. Okay? Why? Because these square, the square lengths of these sides are estimates of the variance parameter sigma squared. Okay. How does that come out? Well, if I take this 5.1 and divide by this 3, I get 1.7. So then there's a column called mean square. And what I do is I take the 5.1 and divide by the 3 and I get 1.7. Okay? That's the estimate of sigma squared coming from this little sticker coming out here. I mean, they have to divide it appropriately. It turns out that the expected value of this little devil over here, uh, excuse me, the expected value of this little devil over here is not sigma squared, it's 3 sigma squared. So I have to divide by 3. In other words, if I fix my x's and I sample over and over and over, okay, with those same fixed x's, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the sample size 5, and I get my y's and I have my model that has constant variability in the y's, then each time, of course, I calculate a beta 0 hat and a beta 1 hat, which corresponds to getting this regression line here. I subtract. I calculate SS res, all right? SYY minus SSR, okay? I go ahead and calculate that. If I actually average now over all these things by repeated sampling with those same fixed X's, then I get N minus 2 times sigma squared, okay? So this is an estimate. This is what I call sigma hat squared, a sigma squared. Now, I'll go through some of that calculation if you want in a little bit, but uh, how that comes actually out to be there. Actually, there's a second. Um, there are two statistical reviews on the website, and the second one of them, called titled ANOVA for Simple Linear Regression, has this calculation, okay, that the expected value of sigma hat squared is equal to sigma squared. Okay? And it also has, there's also something else I calculated. I to take the 4.9 and divide by 1, and of course I just get 4.9. <laughs> it's 4.9 divided by 1, it's 4.9. Okay. But that's an estimate for sigma squared, but it's not unbiased in general. Okay. It's biased if beta 1 is, is unbiased if beta 1 equal to 0, if there is no slope. But in general, it's biased. So the whole trick of this analysis of variance, which is what we're going to use throughout the course, is to check sensitivity to uh, departures from a certain null hypothesis. Okay. It turns out that E MSR, we call this mean squared, so this is called this is called MSR. You put the, take one of the S's and replace it by an M, and it's called the mean square. Uh, regression mean square. Alright? Take the 1.7 into you got the 5.1 divided by 2, that was the 1.7. This is called the MS res. Okay, for the mean square. So it's just you're taking the the sum of squares and dividing by the appropriate degrees of freedom. It turns out, okay, I haven't explained degrees of freedom, but basically it has to do with dimensions here. In this picture, all right, there's one dimension here, 
In fact, that's how you can explain it. Uh, going from the plane to the line, that's one dimension, two down to one, right? Dropping from five space to two space is three drops in dimension, right? A general five-dimensional vector down to a two-dimensional, I mean, only two degrees of freedom in this plane, right? So the, the, the degrees of freedom are actually dimensions. Dimension drops from five dimensions to two dimensions, and from two dimensions to one dimension. Okay? From the plane to the line. That's all it is. All right, so actually, and those turn out, if you divide by those right numbers, then you actually get um, estimators of sigma squared. In this case, always unbiased for sigma squared. This will be my, no matter what beta 0 and beta 1 are, this is, this is equal to sigma squared, okay? As long as my model is correct, that my model for expected value of y given x is a linear function of x. As long as that's valid, and this is sigma squared, if, uh, and this one comes out to be sigma squared plus beta 1 squared SXX, okay? Uh, I think, is it beta 1 squared times SXX? Um, yeah. Notes. i to check the formula. I don't have that very well memorized, sorry. Um, there it is, on the ANOVA, dude. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So when beta 1 is equal to 0, this is also unbiased for sigma squared. So if there really is no linear relationship between y and x, then you get two unbiased uh, estimators. And they're independent because of the orthogonality of these vectors here, it turns out. Assuming we have normal errors, okay? So now I'm going to add an extra assumption. Up to this point, I didn't need anything. But now if I really want to get statistical tests, I'm going to have to assume normality of the errors. Okay? Up to this point, estimation has been fine. Everything I've written down is correct. No problem. We hadn't talked about it. But now if I want to get a statistical test of whether beta 1 is equal to 0 or not, or if, there's a, if, if, if I can really say that beta 1 is significantly different from 0, if there really is some kind of trend. All right, I can still estimate beta 1 equal to zero, unequal to 0. I had beta 1 equal to 0.7. But is there enough evidence that there really is some relationship between y and x in those five points? If I don't make some uh, statistical assumptions <laughs> besides what I've done, I can't do anything. Eh? So I have to bring in normality of the errors now. Does everybody see the sequence of things? I'm adding one more layer because I'm trying to get more information. I mean, I can fit this line, negative 0.1 plus 0.7x, and yeah, so that's the best fitting line. But could I have just gotten that data just, you know, if there really was no relationship? I mean, it might have been I just would have gotten that kind of, you know, I would have just gotten some, you know, it would have been, all, you know, some trend because it just would have been up and down data, okay? Because it's such a small sample, okay? There's only five points there, right? If there were 25, you'd say, no, 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 that's not possible, okay? But, you know, you know, depending on how big the sigma squared is, if it was noisy or not. If it was 25 points, if sigma squared is big enough, it just might look like a blob of points anyway, okay? You see what I'm saying? If there's a blob, with no trend, that corresponds to independence, roughly speaking, of y and x, and so corresponding to uh, beta 1 equal to 0. There's no, you know, there's no relationship at all, okay? In particular, the, the mean would not depend linearly on x, okay? <clears throat> so, here, now I go ahead and make some assumptions. The MSR is still this without any extra assumptions. The MS res is still this without any assumptions. But now, if I want to get independence of these two estimators, these, then I need the normality. So it turns out this is the secret of jointly normal variables that orthogonality in this picture corresponds to independence of the two vectors in the appropriate sense. Okay. So there's the, the, norm, the normal distribution also falls in 
it's a beautiful thing that it corresponds to this linear algebra independence corresponding to orthogonality uh, statistical independence so then these two estimators become independent and under the null hypothesis they're both unbiased for sigma squared if you take the ratios then we can actually calculate what that distribution is because the sigma squared scales out right you have a sigma squared factor in here. It turns out then MSR will be sigma squared times a chi square one. So under uh, normality, with normality, assume now epsilon i or nid. I'm going to go to the computer now because we're going to run out of time. Nid zero sigma squared. It means the normal and independently distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared. He has this notation in the book, normal and independently distributed. Assume now this. Then it turns out that um, that MS res is turns out distributed as sigma squared times the chi square of n minus two degrees of freedom divided by n minus two, where chi square is a uh, or chi-square. I'm not going to get to the whole statistical review today. That's for sure. I'm going to have to take little bits and pieces, I think, as we go through and you start to read it, because otherwise nobody will be able to follow it anyway. I mean, not as efficiently as I would hope. You will be able to follow it, but what's a chi-square? A chi-square of new degrees of freedom is a sum is by definition a sum of of new squares of standard normal z1 this is part of the statistical review part z1 through z new standard independent standard normal so nid 0 1 okay so we have new so in other words ms res is sigma squared times chi square nu divided by nu where nu is n minus 2 Nu is just divided by degrees of freedom, where nu equals n minus two. Okay, so it's a it's a normalized chi square. Chi square will have mean the number of its degrees of freedom. This is the number of its degrees of freedom nu. Okay, the chi square with new degrees of freedom has mean nu because the squares of each of these standard normals has mean one. So one plus one plus one up to nu. Okay. And so what I've done here is I've, I have the distribution is simply, this is consistent with that information over there, because if I take the expectation of this, if I get sigma squared times the expectation of chi squared nu divided by nu, I'll just get sigma squared times one. Nu divided by nu is one, all right? Uh, so the expectation of chi squared nu is nu. The expectation of chi squared nu divided by nu is one. So the expectation of MS res is sigma squared according to this result, all right? But in fact, uh, so this, this is a fact, and I'm not going to be able to derive this for you in this course. 481 will derive this, okay? So the fall course, it follows 381. Uh, we actually go through this theory, how this works out. And actually the theory of how this then will also be independent of, and MS res also, MS res and MSR are independent. Random variables. Statistically independent random variables. Okay? Either given the x's, and we'll just say given the x's. Alright? So we're, we're fixing the x's. So we'll assume here that when I said epsilon i or nid, that's for fixed x's. Right? That's all I need. It's a little mind-boggling. Are you fixing X's or unfixing them? Those are very technical. But I think you understand what we're talking about. Repeated sampling with fixed X's. Those are independent random variables. And moreover, if beta 1 equal to 0, then MSR, which I don't have in any other special name for, other than MSR. Like we had, we had two names for MS res. We said it was sigma hat squared, right? 
we have two names for MS res. It's sigma hat squared and MS res. But for MSR, I only have MSR. <laughs> okay. Um, this turns out to be, this is distributed as sigma squared times chi square of one degree of freedom, of course, divided by one. Divided by one doesn't change it. And it's independent of the other one. Okay? So therefore, under H naught, beta one equal to zero, if I consider the hypothesis beta one equal to zero, then I get that um, MSR divided by MSE, that's a ratio of two um, things. That becomes a sigma squared chi square one divided by one over a sigma squared chi square nu divided by its degrees of freedom. Okay, in other words, these are normalized chi squares. That's, and that's, um, and the sigma squares cancel. The sigma squares cancel. I don't know what sigma squared is, but they cancel. And they get a distribution that doesn't depend on any parameters. Where, because the chi square one and the chi square nu are independent, this, the distribution can actually be calculated. This is an F one nu. It's what's called an F one nu. When you take properly normalized chi squares independent and you quotient them, then you get a so-called F distribution. Okay, so the chi squares and the f's, if you didn't have them in your math 381 or your previous statistics course, here I'm kind of introducing them. Okay? <laughs> it's like if I had, um, you know, so you can think of, of of, uh, I guess you can think of, of, of a vector of standard normal, you know, you can think of y equals to z1 up to zn, okay, a bunch of standard normal variables, okay, and then, um, let's see, how would you, and then you would, okay, then you can project it down onto um, and then the line one 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 here, okay, linear span of one, and then you'd have your uh, y bar times one sitting here, and you can think of that projection problem, and then this this is how you could define a chi square, okay? This is a, the square length of this side of the triangle. This will be a right triangle then, okay? And let's see the square length of this thing. Let's see, with appropriate constants put in, this will be basically your chi square of n minus 1 degrees of freedom. No, n minus 1, not n minus 2. This will be your chi square of 1 degree of freedom. Okay? That's pretty much how it's going down. Okay? Uh, I'm not making it very precise. <laughs> okay. But uh, let's see, what would it be? This is a, um, a constant times chi square n minus 1, and this is a different constant times chi square um, 1, okay? Time for the square lengths. The constants are just depending on n and, and so on, okay? Uh, so it's not exactly just 1, I don't believe here. Um, I'd have to take, um, figure out what the mean of this thing is. What is the mean of that? Oh, no, that's right. Let's see, what is the expectation? That's right. No, I think this is just chi squared minus 1, and this is just chi squared 1. Let's see. So I take uh, n y, y bar squared, which would be the length of this guy, okay? That comes down to be y, uh, summation y, uh, that comes out to therefore be summation z i um, squared over n. No, no, no. It turns out to be that z bar squared times n, which is z bar is summation z i over n. So this is um, equals, let's see, so that's summation z i divided by the square root of n squared. Right, okay. So that would be, this would be standard normal of unit variance, that's right. So that was exactly right. This is chi square one, that's chi square n minus one. So you can think of it, 
chi square of one degree freedom, because this is itself a sum of normal variable, independent normal variables is itself a normal variable. And this is the right uh, normalization to have variance one. So this is a standard normal square, which is chi square one. So this is exactly how you can think of chi squares if you want. All right? As I take an arbitrary vector consisting of independent standard normals in Rn, okay, and each time I project it onto this line, one, 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 okay, and I get a right triangle. So every time I do that, I get another right triangle. Take all the lengths, no, all the longer sides, okay, so to speak, okay, and they, they make up a chi square n minus one distribution. The squares of the lengths make the chi square n minus one. The squares of the lengths here make a chi square one, okay? Chi square one plus chi square n minus one equals chi square n, obviously, uh, if they're independent, okay, which they would be in this case. So that's another way you can think of chi square. So roughly what's happening is the chi squares are popping out here, okay? If you make enough assumptions, all right? And the, chi the dimensions correspond to degrees of freedom. All right, so you get this thing, so you can test this hypothesis, beta zero, beta one equal to zero, because why? If beta one is not equal to zero, then in fact the numerator, which is MSR, will have a positive bias for sigma squared. In other words, bias is this amount, the beta one squared SXX. Unbiased means the expectation is equal to the parameter you're looking at. The parameter I'm looking at is sigma squared. This is an unbiased, sigma hat squared is an unbiased estimate of sigma squared. Okay, I'm trying to explain the analysis of variance table. Let's go to the computer and see one, okay? Last thing we'll do, we'll go to the computer, okay? We've got 10 minutes. Oh, where did this thing go? Okay, here it is. Comments about this? Sorry, I'm spending way too much time with this. So you get an F, what's it, my, I'll just say what the F is. I kind of have a messy board here. But, okay, let's, let's put the, uh, I, I, the uh, well, this was the explanation. I, I went over it too quickly. When beta 1 is unequal to 0, I get a ratio of variance estimators. I'm going to take the ratio now, the F ratio, which is the 4.9 divided by the 1.7, okay? Which comes out to be 2.8, 8, I believe, okay? Now, if beta 1 were equal to 0, it would have a ratio of sigma squareds, and they just get an F1 new distribution, and, and uh, okay. So is this consistent with the F1 new distribution, this 2.88? Or is it bigger than it should be, so to speak? If beta 1 is unequal to 0, it makes sense that it should be bigger than it should, you know, would be, right? I get something that, um, because, because I get a biased estimator for sigma squared in the numerator, okay? So the ratio of these two numbers will be bigger than one. Right? It'll be too big if beta one is unequal to zero. And otherwise, if beta one is equal to zero, eh, it's just kind of middling. Now, is this 2.88 big relative to F13? In this case, it's F13, because that's the degrees of freedom in the numerator and denominator. Or is it not? And so then I can make a statistical test. I can say, if this 2.88 is above a certain percentage point of the F distribution, then I reject the null hypothesis of the beta 1 equal to 0. So I get a p-value. OK? Let's look. Do you know what stats package you have Excel? OK, Excel is just, is this a standard thing? I get, I've heard that Google is going to come up with a, a competitor to Excel, by the way, maybe in another year. It's out now. In beta, okay. But um, but maybe everybody will be, everybody will not be using Google yet. So for this summer, we're still in Excel, okay. <laughs> Everybody's been using Excel for eons. Now, there is plenty of statistical software out there. It's many tabbies illustrating here. He also, every once in a while, talks about SAS, Statistical Analysis System, which is the big industrial uh, much older one has been around forever, since the probably early 70s. Uh, 
I need to put. Wrong S video. Did I say the wrong thing? Oh, it said S video, which is generally not the right one. Okay, the wrong, uh, thank you. The wrong toggle? No, uh, where's your remote? There's an input button on that. Okay. Okay, thank you. That's the one. <laughs> okay. So let's have a look at one of these. This is the, um, this is simply the, oh, what do they want here? Okay. <laughs> You just want me to say okay. Um, this is the data, the rocket propellant data. So what? Did, and this you can see. What did I do? How did I, I put in the age and I put in the shear strength? I had to copy that data in from wherever my data bank was. Then what did I do? I used a tool over here um, from data analysis. So let's go to excuse me, not, called under tools. There's something called, it's not there, okay, which is typical, okay, <laughs> of this machine. So I add it in, okay? So go to add-ins under tools. If you don't already have it in, in yours, if you have the standard Excel booted, you have to, use it in the add -ins, yeah. you have to go to add-ins and add it in, okay? So go to add-ins, see analysis tool pack and analysis tool pack VBA. Check both of those, anything else you want, okay? Say okay. Now I go back to tools and go to data analysis. And there we got it, okay? Anything you want, pretty much, for this course, all right? And that is I want to do regression. Ah, there she is, okay? All right, input Y range. I simply take these and slap them in there for the Y's, okay? Go in. I go to input X range. Now also input Y range, you can put more than one column of Y's in. So you can, uh, excuse me, one, I'm sorry, incorrect. Only one column of Y's. But for input X range, I can put more than one regressor, okay? And we're gonna get into multiple regression here soon enough. I mean, by the end of the week, I guess. So then I put in the X's, okay? This is simple linear regression, only one column of X's, all right? Only one column of Y's ever, but you can put more than one. You can, like, put a block of X's in there, okay? Labels, uh, whatever. Constant is zero is a special case. That's the no-intercept model. It'll analyze it differently. I don't check that off, all right? Then uh, output range. Uh, I'm going to put a new worksheet because I already got this messed up on this worksheet, okay? So I'm going to put a, a new worksheet and... Do I want to have the residuals? Yes, I want to have the residuals and normal probability plot. I'm going to skip that for now. Okay? Because <laughs> it's too much to discuss. Okay? Okay. So she give me a second sheet and she do the job. Okay. There it is. So there's, and what I have here is some summary output. Maybe I'll make it a little bit bigger to make it more readable. So all the calculations have been done on the board all day. It did it for this much more complicated data set in a, you know, in a, fraction of a second. Now also they've got repeated information. These last, there's something wrong with their workbook function because these two, these four columns here, the last two columns are the same as the first two columns. I think that's based off of uh, when you're using multiple progressors. I think it changes. Yeah, it might, might change. Okay, so I'm just going to clear this business. Okay. Yeah, probably that'll change when you go to uh, more than one regressor. Very good. Now, uh, what this gives is the beta, what this gives you is the beta zero hat, that's the intercept, and the beta one hat. This is for that rocket propellant data that we had shown on pages 16 and 17, or however it was. Okay, that's beta zero hat and beta one hat. I can write that down for you if you want. Beta zero hat. Now the way I'm going to do that, um, in order to, because <laughs> I can't do subscripts and all that business, I'm going to do it like this. In my uh, workbooks, I'm going to write out the word beta. I'm going to put a sub-zero, and then I'm going to dash hat. Okay? <laughs> All right. Beta one hat, obviously. Similar idea. Okay. So here's your regression sum of squares. Here's your um, SSR. Um, right there. 
And it tells you, uh, it tells you, I'm sorry, this is your SSR. What did I do? I've got all these digits in it. Yikes. Okay, this is your SSR. Okay. Regression sum of squares. Okay. Here's your SS res. If you want to, you know, uh, play with your stuff a little bit here, your output. I'm just adding stuff in for emphasis. Okay, and this is your SST. Okay. And then you had your mean squares, which you divide those things by the appropriate degrees of freedom. Let's see, I didn't divide this. This one stayed the same as SS divided by 1 is the same number, you see, the MS. And this one was divided by 18. Okay, that's your sigma hat squared. So that corresponds to the standard error here, which is sigma hat. That's the square root of this 9236 is the 96. So this is your sigma hat without the square on it. And this is your sigma hat squared. So everybody knows what it is. Okay? It's the 9236. All right? And then you have, you don't do an MS for, for total sum of squares. You just don't do it. So you have this, that's the formula. Then the F was, F ratio was 165. Okay? And that's under the null hypothesis that beta 1 equal to 0. That's an F1, that's the sample value of an F118. Isn't the F test that both of them are equal to 0? No. The only the beta, only the, everything but the intercept. They're all equal to zero. So if it was both a regression, it would be beta one equal to zero and beta two equal to zero. But not the beta zero. No, that would say that basically you have, that you have mean zero. If you want beta zero and beta one equal to zero, then all the, then all the y values are near zero. Or alternating between negative and positive numbers, okay? That necessarily wouldn't be the case. That would be assuming, you know, the, you adjusted the mean. So uh, the F ratio then is 165, and P, the P value here was 10 to the minus 10, okay? So in other words, yes, the regression is significant. There was a trend, okay? So because the P value is very small, all right? You would reject the hypothesis of beta 1 equal to 0 at the level alpha equals 10 to the minus 10 approximately. All right? So normally, if you have a regression problem, it's always significant. All right? If it's not significant for, for some reason, if in this table, the, if you set all the beta 1, beta 2, and so on equal to 0, we haven't gotten to beta 2 yet, so. But he's asking about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, then something's wrong. Okay? There's no, I mean, there's no predictive power at all, okay? So normally that's, that's significant, but we'll get into uh, different kinds of F-tests that wouldn't have to necessarily be significant if you're trying to test whether beta 2 is equal to 0 only, okay? Maybe I don't need the uh, predictive power of a second regressor. Okay, X is called a regressor. But I could have age, and I could have um, some other property of this propellant. What else can you imagine? I don't know, some other property. Um, temperature stored at. Temperature stored at, something like humidity. that. Humidity, whatever. You know? And you'd have these other regressions, and you could make a, a regression equation that involved not only just X, but also these other regressors, okay? And so you would do something like y equals beta, beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2, where now um, x1 is not the first thing but the first variable, or xi1, xi2 like this, yi equals this plus error, okay? And so now this would be age and this would be temperature stored at, okay? Then you can talk about testing the hypothesis beta 2 is equal to 0 only. Okay, and that may be true, that, that the temperature survey has no predictive power at all, okay, given that the 
age has already been included as a, uh, as a factor. All right? And so you may indeed be able to reject this one. Okay? So you'd have an F test for that. But the F test that's always given in this output here is for beta 1 equal to 0 and beta 2 equal to 0. It just sets all the slope parameters equal to 0. Okay? And gives you one F test. And that's all that's given in this summary table uh, up there. Okay? As we'll see. Okay, you only get one F table, okay? When you do multiple regression. And that's always significant. All right. That has to be. Otherwise, you know, maybe 10 to the minus 5 instead of 10 to the minus 10 because of various factors. But there you go. So here's the predicted Ys and here's the residuals. Okay, if I go back to sheet 1, I showed the residual plot. It actually showed it on this sheet too, but um, let's see. And, oh, I was going to get into charting these things. I guess I'll do that next time. I didn't show that on this page, but we'll go into go ahead and chart, and put, you know, how to use Excel. So here's your first example of how to use Excel. Put in the data and in, in your data analysis tools. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's it for today, then. I gave you some exercises due Thursday, which is to start um, doing some of these um, calculations. So there's some... Um, Gas mileage um, information, what is the one? It's on, I think there's one data set you have to deal with. Problem 2.4. Uh, data on the gasoline mileage performance of 32 different automobiles. Fit a simple linear regression model, construct the analysis of variance test, and test for significance of regression, exactly what we've done here so far. What percentage of the total variability in gasoline mileage is accounted for the, by the linear relationship with engine displacement? Okay, that has to do with, um, I didn't say what R square was, but R square, if you take this triangle that I had, okay, is the SSR divided by SST. So it's a so-called percentage of the total variability that's accounted for by the regression. In other words, it sort of tells you how close this, the original vector was to the plane. If it's very close to the plane, then SSE is going to be very small, and SSR over SST is going to be near 100%. It's always less than 100% because the side of a right triangle divided by the hypotenuse, of the square of the hypotenuse. So that's what the R square is, and that's what the answer to part C of that problem is. And I think that's all we'll do for today. We'll go over that again next time. Okay? Thank you, Nicholas, for your attention and patience with me.